Section 11 of Astounding Stories 8, August 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Astounding Stories 8, August 1930, by Various. Earth the Marauder, Part 2 of a three-part novel by Arthur J. Burks. Chapter 15 the place of the blue light. So the gnomes were moon people, masters of the moon cubes, and people and cubes were ruled by a woman who resembled a woman of earth. The gnomes took them back the way they had come. Where, Sarka wondered, were the people of the gens of Dalis, and where was Dalis himself? Sarka was sure that in those first discords which had come out of the crater he had heard at least a hint of the laughter of Dalis. And this woman clothed in radiance, who was she, and what? That she was a creature of the moon, and yet resembled in all ways a woman of earth, save that she was more beautiful than any woman Sarka had ever seen, seemed almost impossible to believe. Yet he had seen her. So had Jaska, and as Sarka and Jaska, with the capering gnomes still about them, were led away to a fate at which they could only guess. Sarka wondered at Jaska's silence and at the strange lack of expression on her face. He pressed her hand, but somehow she failed to return the pressure, mystifying more than ever. This sudden coldness wasn't like Jaska. Back they went through the vast cavern where the cone of the bluish column still moaned and murmured. Sarka moved as close to the cone as the gnomes would permit, and peered up along the mighty length of the column. At its tip was still the earth, like a star viewed from the bottom of a deep well. Smaller, too, it seemed, which proved that Sarka's breaking of the blue column had been but momentary, but the column had almost instantly regained its contact with the earth. What was its source? What the composition of the column? At the moment there could be no answer to the question. Now the gnomes were escorting them into another tunnel, whose glow was even bluer than that which the two had experienced in the other tunnels. And the deeper they penetrated, the more distant from the cavern of the cone, the deeper in color became that light. Finally, the gnome, who had mentally asked permission of the radiant woman to show her Jaska and Sarka, passed before another expanse of wall, identical in appearance with that of the wall of the triangle from which the radiant woman had appeared. This time the gnome managed ingress by a strange clacking sound, with his triangular lips held close to the base line of the triangle. Now the door swung open, but the radiance which now came out wasn't clear white, as in the case of the outer door, but deeply coldly blue. For the first time the gnomes used force with their prisoners, thus proving to them that they were indeed prisoners. Their tiny feet caught at Sarka and at Jaska, and forced them through the door, which swung shut behind them. Sarka looked at Jaska, who in this strange new light had taken on the color of Indigo, and smiled at her. She didn't return his smile, but her eyes looked deeply, somewhat sorrowfully, into his. As though she asked him a question he couldn't understand, to which he could therefore give no answer. Sarka was now conscious of the fact that the heat of their prison house, whose character they didn't as yet know, was becoming almost unbearable. They were alone too, for the gnomes hadn't entered the door of triangle. Sarka partially removed his live mask, and testing the atmosphere of the place, found it capable of being breathed without the mask. He signaled mentally to Jaska to remove her mask, and when the girl had done so he took her in his arms and kissed her on the lips. She accepted his caress, but didn't return it, and her eyes still peered deeply into his. Well, beloved, he said, I'm terribly sorry, but I didn't want you to come because I was afraid that something of this sort would happen. She didn't answer. What is it, Jaska? he said at last. What did you think of that woman? she asked softly. Beautiful, he said enthusiastically. Fearfully beautiful. But did you see her eyes? She had no more mercy in her heart than if she were made of stone. And she hated us both at the moment she saw us. And you, Sarka, 
Did you hate her, too? Sarka stared at her, not comprehending. I feel, he said, that if we are ever to escape her, we must kill her, or render her incapable of retaining us. Then, of her own accord, Jaska placed her arms around Sarka and gave him her lips. Her new behavior was as incomprehensible to Sarka as her former enigmatic expression had been. Wise in the ways of science was Sarka, but he knew nothing of women. Now, hand in hand again, they began a survey of their prison house. The bluish glow was unbearable to the eyes and tears came unbidden and ran down the cheeks of the prisoners. In a minute or two, perspiration was literally bathing the bodies of the two. After a question and exchange of glances, Sarka swiftly divested himself of his costume, stripping down the gray toga of Earth's manhood. With a shrug, Jaska removed her clothing to her own toga, and the two suits Sarka carried under his arm. They started ahead, exploring, then sprang back with a cry of fright. Sarka didn't know whether it was Jaska himself who had cried out. For just as they moved forward, a rent opened in the floor at their feet, and their eyes for a moment, they could stand no longer, peered into a bluely flaming abyss which, save for the color, reminded Sarka of the word pictures of hell he had read in Earth's books of antiquity. As the two stepped back, the rent in the floor crossed instantly. Sarka had noted where the end of it had been and started to detour, his eyes on the floor. Over to his left the bluely glowing wall reached up to invisible immensity, but as he would have passed along the wall, the rent opened again, effectually barring his way. Beyond the rent he could see a vast continuation of the cavern, and he felt that, could they only pass the rent, they might reach a place where the heat wasn't so unbearable, and they could stay and talk in comfort. Releasing Jaska, he stepped back and prepared to leap the spot where the rent had been. High he jumped, and far, surprised at the length of his own leap. He landed lightly, far beyond the area where the rent had been, and even as he landed, a rent opened again at his feet, thus effectually barring further progress. It could just as easily, he told himself, have opened under my feet and dropped me into the abyss. From behind him came the sudden sound of screaming. He whirled to look back, to see Jaska standing there, arms outstretched toward him, her eyes wide with fear and horror. And as he stood watching, she raced to him, unmindful of abysses that might open under her feet, and flung herself into his arms. "'Come back,' she moaned. "'Come back. Don't you see? They don't wish you to explore further. We are in their power and must simply await their pleasure, whoever or whatever they are. They see all we do.' So they turned back and stood against the door which held them prisoners and the heat of the place seemed to enter into them, to know at their very vitals. After a time Sarka found himself almost tearing at his throat, fighting for breath. Gasping the tears bathing their cheeks until even their tears and their perspiration would flow no more, they huddled now just inside the massive stone door, arms about each other and almost prayed for death. Sarka at least prayed for death for both of them. But Jaska prayed for a way of deliverance, prayed that herself and Sarka might somehow win free and be together again. Sarka, who knew little women, marveled at the grandeur of her courage, and wondered that he really knew this radiant woman so little. He compared her in his mind with the unclosed woman who had ordered them here as prisoners, and it came to him that Jaska was all perfection, all tender womanhood, while the radiant woman was a monster, without soul or compassion, a creature of horror who mocked God with her outward seeming of perfection. Jaska read his thoughts, and smiled wonder to herself, and Sarka wondered how, suffering as he knew she must be suffering, she could find the courage to smile. Then, for a time, the two became comatose, mastered by the blue heat, and in dreamlike imaginings wandered in strange fields which could only, to these two, have been racial memories, since neither had ever seen such fields. 
There were cool streams, all a murmur, and breezes which cooled their sun-tanned cheeks. Water touched their tongues, and cooled their whole bodies as they gratefully imbibed it. In their wanderings, in which Sarka was a faun and Jaska a nymph, they talked together in a language which only these two comprehended, language which dealt in fears of speech, language which depended upon hand-clasps for periods, glances of their eyes for commas, and the singing of their hearts for complete understanding. Then a cool breeze, cool by comparison, caressed their pain-distorted cheeks. The gnomes came in, found them lying there and clucked endlessly as though wondering what to do with them. From hand to tiny hand, their feet serving as hands, the gnomes passed garments, garments of the gens of Dalis, and clothed again the two whom the place of the blue light had all but slain. Of that ghastly experiment, Sarka retained but one real memory, that bluish light. In the midst of their abyss, shifting and swaying like blue serpents swimming in haze, that bluish light of the cone, which he had broken up for a brief moment by the use of his ray director. Was this bluish light in the abyss the source of the light in the cone? If one were to destroy it at its source, the two regained consciousness completely as the triangular door closed behind Sarka and Jaska and the gnomes, and they were taken into the refreshing coolness of the tunnel, led back again in the direction of the room where they had seen the radiant woman. Both Jaska and Sarka noticed that they were clothed in new clothing, and a shy blush tinged the cheeks of Jaska as her eyes met those of Sarka. This time they entered the vast chamber of radiance behind the first triangular door and were forced to their knees to do obeisance to the radiant woman, who sat on a gleaming yellow stone for days. The guards who forced Sarka and Jaska to their knees were clothed in the green of the gens of Dalis, and Dalis himself, his face stern but bearing no sign of recognition of these two, stood at the right hand of the radiant woman. You come to us as spies, the thought of the radiant woman impinged upon the brains of Sarka and of Jaska. And as spies you should be given to the cone. But if you swear eternal allegiance to me, to obey me in all things, to forgo your allegiance to earth, your lives will be spared. What say you? Boldly Sarka stared into the almost opaque eyes of the woman. Then his glance went to the face of Dalis. What, he asked boldly in the language of Earth, does the traitor Dalis say? I have sworn allegiance to Luar, who addresses you, and am her ally in all things. I have but one addition to make to what she says. Jaska belongs to me. The sudden leering grin of Dalis was hideous. Sark appeared at Jaska framing his answer, but Jaska spoke first. For myself, O Dalis, she said swiftly, I can answer in but one way. Return me to the place of the blue light, and forget me there. Sarka smiled, while his heart leaped with joy. And I, O Luar, he said mentally to the radiant woman, prefer death with Jaska and the place of the blue light than life as a traitor to the world of my nativity. Instantly Luar began the clacking sound which was the language of the gnomes, at the same time allowing her thoughts as she spoke to impress themselves upon the brains of the prisoners. Take them away, take them to the cavern of the cone, and when they have suffered as much as such inferior beings are capable of suffering, thrust them into the base of the cone. Chapter 16 Cavern of the Cone the gnomes had been bidden to take the prisoners to the cavern of the cone, but to the surprise of Sarka and Jaska, they were taken back to the place of the blue light. This time the gnomes entered the place with them, closing and securing the door behind them. But the place of the blue light had changed. Now it had no flow of blue, as it had had before, but only a corridor perhaps wide enough to allow the passage of four grown men, walking side by side while the abyss of which the two had got but the merest hint through the opening and closing rents filled all the center of the place. The gnomes seemed impervious to the unendurable heat, and this, 
moving together, one behind the other, one beside the other, one atop the other, formed a living wall between Sarka and Jaska and the rim of the flaming blue abyss, to protect them from the heat. Yet through the bodies of this living wall of gnomes, a wall which was higher than the heads of Sarka and Jaska, the heat forced its way to the prisoners, and burned them anew with its agony. To what dread rendezvous were they going? Where, save for the few guards at the house of Luar, were the people of the gens of Dalis? Sarka felt somehow that the answers to all these questions would soon be made manifest, and a feeling of exultation he couldn't explain was possessing him as he advanced. Around the corridor, whose one side was the wall reaching up to invisibility, whose other side dropped off into the abyss, the gnomes herded the prisoners. The leader of the gnomes was again the gnome who had first leaped upon Jaska to examine her curiously. Now, watching the lidless eyes of this being, Sarka fancied he could detect a hint of some expression. The gnome was excited at some prospect, some climax which they were approaching. What? On and on they moved, the blue flames from the abyss roaring in a way that neither of the prisoners had ever experienced, reached upward in searing tongues toward the invisible roof of this place. Then, when they had progressed far from the door of entry, Sarka gasped at a new manifestation. Out of the abyss, some distance ahead, came a gleaming thing, something that had apparently evolved itself out of the flames of the abyss. Blue of color it was, because of the flames from the pit. But Sarka recognized it with a start, which he couldn't suppress nor understand. It was one of those cubes such as he and Jaska had seen at the lip of the moon crater. As they approached, guided by the gnomes, other cubes appeared out of the abyss. Others in number swiftly augmented, until a veritable battalion of them had marshaled itself there at the lip of the abyss. Straight toward these cubes the gnomes led Sarka and Jaska, and when they had reached the center of the group, they halted, forming a circle, still well to mask the prisoners from the heat of the abyss. The leader of the gnomes stopped with his face, his lidless eyes, close to one of the cubes. For a moment he paused thus, and Sarka felt sure that somehow the gnome was holding thought converse with the cube. But try as he might, he could find no meaning in the weird conversation for himself. It was only like listening to a conversation in a code beyond his knowledge. Then the gnome turned back to Sarka and Jaska. By a pressure of tiny feet, he tried to indicate that Sarka and Jaska should unclasp their hands. But they only clung the tighter, and now threw their arms about each other. The gnome desisted, much to the jaw of the lovers, while Sarka studied the cubes, wondering what their mission was with Jaska and himself. Slowly, together, the cubes began to lose their bluish glow, their cube shape, to vanish utterly. In a trice, still locked in each other's arms, Sarka and Jaska saw the gnomes through what appeared to be an even bluer haze. Besides, the heat of the abyss no longer tortured them and their bodies were cooling in a way that was unbelievably refreshing. "'What is it, beloved?' whispered Jaska. "'What is it?' Sarka stared at the gnomes, now in retreat, capering as they had first capered when the two had fallen into their hands, toward the door by which all had entered. Mystified, Sarka put forth his hand. It came in contact with something solid and oddly warm, which stirred an instantly responsive chord in the brain of Sarka. This feeling was the same as he experienced when he had lifted those cubes and hurled them into the crater, where they had dissolved in falling, and instantly reappeared, each under its own air car. Jaska, he explained, Jaska, the cubes have dissolved themselves, and have reformed in the shape of a globe as a protective covering about us to protect us from the heat of the abyss. Apparently we are not to be killed at once. These cubes are slaves of the gnomes, of whom Lura is ruler. They were indeed locked inside a globe, a globe whose integral parts were the cubes of their acquaintance, and the atmosphere of the interior wasn't uncomfortable, but otherwise. 
Sarka and Jaska were feeling normal for the first time since they had landed on the moon. But what was the meaning of this strange imprisonment? They were soon to know. For the globe which enclosed them moved to the edge of the flaming abyss and dropped into the bluish glow. It didn't drop heavily like a falling object on Earth, but rather floated downward right into the heart of the flames. At this new manifestation of the strangeness of science on the moon, Sarka was at once all scientist himself, striving to find adequate answers for things which from cause to effect were entirely new to him. With Jaska still clasped close against him, he seated himself in the base of the globe and studied the area through which they were passing. Blue flames which seemed to be born somewhere, an infinite distance below them. Blue flames which he knew to be the element that, shot outward from the great cone, had forced the moon away from the earth. No sound of the roaring flames came through the globe, but every movement of them was visible. Sarka turned and peered through the bottom of the globe, but all he could see below were the flames and molten indigo lake of them. Now, as they floated downward, the glow was giving away to light blue, to white, almost pure white, like the radiance which covered Lure like a mantle. Sarka felt himself on the eve of vast important discoveries, and the scientist in him made him, for the moment, almost forget the woman at his side. Jaska, unbothered about anything, now that Sarka was at her side, regarded his expression of deep concentration with a tolerant smile. Whiter now was the light, and faster fell the globe which held the two. The color of the globe, now fallen below the area of blue, had taken on chameleon-like the color of the white flames that bathed it. Then, apparently, right in the center of a lake of white flames, though Sarka could see no solid place on which the globe had landed, the globe came to rest. Now everything was plain to see, and Sarka studied his surroundings with new interest. He felt a mounting sensation of scalp-prickling horror. For scattered throughout the lake of white flames in all directions as far as the eye could reach, standing alone suffering untold agonies from the expressions on their faces, were people of the gens of dailies. No longer were they clothed in green and wearing on breast and back the yellow stars of their gens. Now they were nude as they had come into the world, and standing there, each was holding out hands in horror to hold back myriads of the gnomes who would have forced them to submerge themselves in the white flames of the lake. Was the gens of Davis being burnt alive? What was the meaning of this? For a moment filled with horror, Sarka looked away from the spectacle. Off to his right, as he said, he noted that the flames, which here seemed lighter than they had in high levels, were converging on a single spot toward the side of the lake of white flames, as smoke converges on the base of a chimney leading outward to the air. He knew as he stared that he was gazing at the spot where the bluish column of the cone was born. Shaking his head, he turned back to the mighty spectacle of this horrible thing that was being done to the people of the gens of Dalis. In his brain there suddenly crashed a thought whose source he could only guess at, whose meaning mystified him more than anything yet experienced. The thought might have emanated from Luar or from Dalis, but the more he thought of the matter, the more he thought how the phrasing of the thought was like the telepathy of Sarka the Second, now thousands of miles away upon the earth. And this was the thought. If they fight the flames, the flames will destroy them. If they go into them freely, voluntarily, they will be rendered immune to heat and to cold, to life and to death. But it's better that they die, for Earth's sake. What did it mean? Sarka thought of the radiant white light which perpetually bathed the person of Lure, and thought that he had somehow been given a hint of its source. If the gens of Dalis were voluntarily bathed in the lake of white flames, would they become as Lure? Somehow, though he knew that such bathing would save their lives, the idea filled him anew with horror. He found himself torn between two duties. If he sent his thought out there to the gens of Dalis, people of Earth, his people, they will be saved, but might forever become allies of the people of the Moon. 
If Sarka didn't tell them, they would die, and there were millions of them. But his science had always been a science of life, and it still was. Enter the flames, he telepathically bade his people. Enter the flames! But they didn't heed him, and for the first time the atmosphere of the interior of the globe seemed filled with savage, abysmal menace. Plain to Sarka was the meaning of that menace. The cubes which composed this globe were loyal to their masters, the masters to a mistress, lure, and would countenance no meddling. Likewise it was impossible, if the gnomes willed it to the cubes, for Sarka to transmit his thoughts to the gens of Dalis through the transparent walls of the globe. They were prisoners, indeed, of Dalis and of Lure. But could Sarka and Jaska turn their newfound knowledge to their own use? Sarka was thinking back, back to one of the ancient tombs of his people. It spoke some place of a man who had got trapped in the heart of a seething volcano, where the heat of it had cured him of his illnesses, made him whole again, given him new youth and freshness. But since the cubes could forestall his transmission of thought, and perhaps could read and understand thoughts, how was he to tell Jaska? How show her that a way of deliverance had been given into their hands, if they only possessed the courage to use it? Again came that thought, which Sarka recognized as the telepathy of his father. Courage! You will win and Jaska with you! Thoughts could come into them then, but couldn't go out. Or did it mean that the cubes, or masters of the cubes, didn't care if the prisoners received messages from outside, because they knew themselves capable of frustrating anything the prisoners planned? Perhaps, more than likely that it was. But looking through the bottom of the globe into the sea of white flames below, Sarka gripped more tightly his ray director, and tried to marshal the forces of his courage. There was surely some way of escape some way out of their strange predicament. End of section 11